You know, fortunately, we do not live in the era of the Holocaust or the Nazis, but we are surrounded by hate, hate speech. In the dark annals of human history, the brutalities of the Nazi regime remain a chilling reminder of the depths of inhumanity that can surface under the right conditions. Among those persecuted were gay men, subjected to atrocities that remain largely obscured within mainstream Holocaust narratives. Number one, the Para 175 and expansion of anti-homosexual laws. Before the rise of the Nazis, the Weimar Republic had seen a relatively tolerant attitude towards homosexuality, especially in larger cities such as Berlin. However, this liberal era would soon face a ruthless end as the Nazi party took power. The Nazis' rise marked a regressive shift in societal attitudes towards homosexuality, largely orchestrated through legislative measures. The most notorious among these was paragraph 175 of the German Penal Code. This law was initially enacted in 1871, and it criminalized sexual acts between males. Prior to the Nazi reign, enforcement of Para 175 was sporadic and usually lax, but this would drastically change under Hitler's regime. The Nazis expanded Para 175 in 1935 through the Law for the Protection of German Blood and German Honor. In its new incarnation, the law became far more encompassing and explicitly targeted homosexual men. This broadened definition of unnatural indecency criminalized even non-physical relationships or so much as a gesture that could be interpreted as homosexual intent. The expanded law meant that a mere suspicion or accusation was often enough to merit prosecution. Consequently, arrests skyrocketed. It's estimated that between 1933 and 1945, around 100,000 men were arrested under the revised Para 175. Of these, approximately 50,000 were officially sentenced. The sentences were often severe, frequently resulting in prison terms. But the terror did not stop at the prison gates. The Nazis established an elaborate system of identifying, arresting, and prosecuting homosexuals. A special branch of the Gestapo, the Reich Central Office for the Combating of Homosexuality and Abortion, was set up to implement these laws. This agency maintained an infamous pink list of suspected or known homosexuals, providing a ready pool of victims for the regime's cruel machinations. The expansion of Para 175 effectively legalized the Nazis' relentless persecution of homosexuals. It marked the beginning of a campaign of terror that would claim thousands of lives and leave indelible scars on those who survived. This historical reality underscores the extent of the Nazi regime's calculated attack on homosexuality encapsulated in their chilling slogan, Exterminate the Degenerates. The horror was far from over, as these men were to face further brutality in the ensuing years of Nazi rule. The cruel mechanisms of concentration camps and ruthless medical experiments awaited them, bearing witness to the depths of the Nazis' homophobia. Number two, the Pink Triangle. In their machinery of oppression, the Nazis used a sophisticated system of badges to identify and categorize prisoners in concentration camps. A spectrum of colors and shapes was used to label prisoners based on their crimes or reasons for being interned. Among these symbols, one stood out in its peculiar symbolism and the depth of the prejudice it represented, the pink triangle. This inverted triangle was used to identify and shame men imprisoned for homosexuality. Those who bore this badge were subjected to extreme prejudice, not only from the Nazi guards, but also often from fellow inmates. The pink triangle, sewn onto prison uniforms, became a visual representation of their crime and a target for the cruelty and bigotry of the camp's hierarchy. The prisoners with pink triangles were usually treated more harshly than other groups. They were given the most dangerous jobs and received the most severe punishments. The triangle marked them as the lowest of the low in the camps, with their rights and dignity completely stripped away. Their days were filled with hard labor, physical brutality, and psychological torment. The Nazi rationale behind the pink triangle was not merely to identify homosexual men, but also to degrade and emasculate them. The color pink was deliberately chosen for its association with femininity, intending to further humiliate these men in the hyper-masculine environment of the Third Reich. 
Furthermore, wearing the pink triangle did not only signify one's homosexuality, the badge also extended to those branded as having perverted sexual tendencies, including transgender people and even heterosexual men who were considered sexually deviant by the Nazis. In effect, the pink triangle became a mark of sexual nonconformity and a tool of dehumanization. What's more, after the war, the stigma associated with the pink triangle persisted. Many survivors felt compelled to hide their experiences due to ongoing prejudice and lack of societal acceptance. This silence led to a significant lack of testimonies and records concerning the fate of homosexual Holocaust victims. However, with time, the pink triangle has undergone a transformation. From a symbol of shame and persecution, it has been reclaimed as a symbol of pride and resistance. Today, it is a potent emblem in the LGBTQ community, representing a memorial to past suffering and a call to arms against ongoing discrimination. The Pink Triangle's journey from a symbol of Nazi persecution to an icon of gay rights illustrates the power of symbols to carry and transform cultural memory. Despite its origins in a period of extreme darkness, it now stands as a beacon for equality and acceptance, forever reminding us of the courage and resilience of those who suffered under its weight. It is a poignant reminder of a time in history when love and identity could be a death sentence, a time we must strive to ensure never happens again. Number 3. Gestapo's Specialized Units The widespread persecution of gay men under the Nazi regime was not an incidental outcome of broader policies, but a meticulously planned and executed campaign. The architects of this persecution were none other than the infamous secret state police, the Gestapo. To facilitate their crusade against homosexuality, the Gestapo set up specialized units designed explicitly to target gay men. The enforcement of the expanded Para 175 fell within the Gestapo's purview, and they pursued this duty with chilling efficiency. Heinrich Himmler, the chief of the SS and one of the leading figures in the Nazi regime, played a crucial role in shaping the Gestapo's policy toward homosexuals. Himmler harbored a personal abhorrence for homosexuality, viewing it as a threat to the Aryan race's reproductive capability. In 1936, the Reich Central Office for the Combating of Homosexuality and Abortion was established as a special branch of the Gestapo. This unit was devoted to identifying, arresting, and prosecuting gay men and those suspected of being gay. These specialized units developed an extensive network of informants, often pressuring or incentivizing friends, family members, and acquaintances to report suspected homosexuals. As a result of their efforts, an infamous pink list was compiled, identifying known or suspected homosexuals. This register became a ready pool of victims easy targets for the regime's brutal machinations. The pink list was not limited to German nationals. It included names from occupied territories as well, marking the expansion of the Nazis' anti-homosexual campaign beyond Germany's borders. The specialized Gestapo units methodically hunted down their victims, employing brutal interrogation tactics to extract confessions and information about other potential targets. The confessions, often procured under duress or torture, led to an exponential increase in arrests and prosecutions under the expanded Para 175. Moreover, the Gestapo did not merely target individuals, but also sought to dismantle the broader homosexual community. They systematically shut down clubs, bars, and other meeting places, decimating safe spaces and networks of support that had been developed over years. Publications and organizations advocating for gay rights were similarly crushed, erasing the emerging narrative of acceptance and equality. The Gestapo's relentless campaign against gay men created an atmosphere of fear and suspicion, where anyone could be an informant and a mere accusation could lead to arrest and internment. This pervasive climate of terror had profound psychological impacts on gay men, leaving scars that would linger far beyond the years of Nazi rule. By establishing specialized units to target homosexuals, the Gestapo was instrumental in implementing the Nazi regime's chilling vision of a racially pure Aryan state. Their ruthless campaign left thousands dead and shattered countless lives, casting a long shadow over the lives of gay men in Nazi-occupied Europe. Number 4. 
conversion, and curing practices. In their quest to establish a racially and ideologically pure society, the Nazis resorted to pseudoscientific practices aimed at curing homosexuality. Couched in the language of medicine and science, these practices subjected gay men to horrific physical and psychological abuse, driven by the twisted belief that homosexuality was an illness that could and should be treated. One of the prominent figures in this field was SS officer Dr. Karl Vernet. Working in Buchenwald and Neuengamme concentration camps, Vernet conducted a series of experiments aimed at converting homosexuals into heterosexuals. His primary method was the implantation of artificial hormone glands, which he believed would stimulate the production of male hormones and suppress homosexual impulses. Men were forced to undergo these surgeries without their consent, under barbaric conditions and without proper post-surgical care. The procedures often led to severe infections, complications, and in some cases, death. Despite the high failure rate and the suffering it caused, Vernet's work was supported by Heinrich Himmler, who was obsessed with increasing the German birth rate to bolster the Aryan race. Another horrific practice involved forced sexual interactions with female sex slaves. The Nazis believed that exposure to heterosexual sex would cure gay men of their deviant desires. This enforced sexual violence was not only physically invasive, but also psychologically damaging, adding another layer of trauma to their already horrifying ordeal. Furthermore, some gay prisoners were subjected to behavioral therapies intended to re-educate them. These typically involved brutal physical and psychological torture designed to associate homosexual desires with pain and fear. It was an abhorrent distortion of Pavlovian conditioning principles aimed at fundamentally altering an individual's sexual orientation. Psychiatric treatment was another avenue explored by Nazi doctors. Psychiatrists like Dr. Friedrich Panzi argued that homosexuality was a mental illness that could be treated with a combination of therapy and medication. These treatments often involved the use of electroconvulsive therapy, inducing seizures by passing electricity through the brain, causing memory loss and cognitive impairment. These conversion and curing practices illustrate the Nazi regime's fundamental misunderstanding of sexuality. The belief that homosexuality could be cured was a grave error and showed a complete disregard for human dignity and personal identity. The procedures subjected thousands of gay men to immeasurable suffering, dehumanizing them under the guise of scientific and medical progress. The legacy of these practices still haunts the medical and scientific communities today, a chilling reminder of the consequences when science is perverted by ideology. It also serves as a grim reminder of the resilience of the human spirit in the face of such abhorrent violations, a testament to the endurance and courage of the men who survived these terrifying treatments. Number five, persecution and public humiliation. While the horrors inflicted on gay men by the Nazis within the walls of concentration camps were unfathomable, the suffering did not stop at the camp's gates. Outside, in the broader society, gay men faced a systematic campaign of public humiliation and social ostracism designed to isolate and dehumanize them further. The Nazis, masters of propaganda, used various mediums to stoke anti-gay sentiments among the general population. Through newspapers, posters, films and speeches, they depicted homosexuality as a disease, a threat to the moral fabric of society and the purity of the Aryan race. Homosexuals were painted as deviants, predators and corruptors of youth. This propaganda fueled widespread homophobia, making gay men targets of societal scorn and contempt. Public humiliation was a key tactic used by the Nazis. Men arrested under Para 175 were often paraded through towns and cities, subject to the jeering and derision of the populace. Their names and photos were published in newspapers, along with lurid details of their crimes. This public shaming served not just to degrade the individuals involved, but also to send a stark warning to others. Societal ostracism was another part of the persecution. Friends, families and neighbors, driven by fear and indoctrination, often turned their backs on those suspected or accused of homosexuality. This loss of social support networks was devastating, leaving many men isolated and defenseless against the Nazi machinery. The persecution extended to intellectual and cultural spheres as well. 
Works by gay authors or those addressing homosexuality were banned and often publicly burned, erasing narratives of gay identity and experience. This cultural erasure was a part of the broader campaign to marginalize and silence the gay community. The public humiliation and social ostracism faced by gay men under the Nazi regime were a key aspect of the broader campaign of persecution. They served to isolate and degrade gay men, undermining their dignity and resilience. This societal persecution left deep psychological scars, compounding the physical torture and trauma inflicted within the camps. However, despite these attempts to erase them from society, many gay men found ways to resist, survive, and maintain their identities in the face of such overwhelming hostility. Their courage and resilience serve as a powerful testament to the human spirit's ability to endure and rise above even the most horrific circumstances. Number six, concentration camps. The grim reality for many gay men under the Nazi regime was internment in concentration camps where they faced deplorable conditions and extreme cruelty. Branded with the pink triangle, these men were among the most despised groups within the camps, subjected to harsh treatment by both the guards and fellow prisoners. Once they arrived at the camps, homosexual prisoners were systematically dehumanized and subjected to relentless physical and psychological torture. They were often given the hardest labor assignments, working to exhaustion in brutal conditions. Many were deliberately worked to death in what the Nazis termed extermination through labor. Punishments for gay prisoners were particularly severe. They were often chosen for cruel punishments, such as flogging, hanging by their wrists, or standing for hours in roll call. Such punishments were not only intended to cause physical pain, but also to degrade and humiliate them. The physical violence was accompanied by psychological torment. Many prisoners were subjected to re-education efforts, which included propaganda lectures, forced viewings of heterosexual pornography, and even forced sexual activity with female prisoners in an attempt to convert them to heterosexuality. Medical experiments were another horrific aspect of camp life for some gay prisoners. Doctors such as Carl Vernet conducted brutal procedures and experiments, often without anesthesia or proper medical care, in attempts to cure homosexuality. Food and medical care, already inadequate in the camps, were often withheld from gay prisoners as an additional form of punishment. The combined effects of hard labor, brutal punishments, medical experiments, inadequate nutrition, and lack of medical care led to a high death rate among gay prisoners. Life in the camps was a daily struggle for survival, marked by constant fear, pain, and degradation. However, despite the inhumane conditions and brutal treatment, many gay men managed to maintain their humanity and identity. They found ways to support each other, forming clandestine relationships and networks of care and resistance. The atrocities committed in concentration camps are among the darkest numbers of human history, a stark testament to the depths of cruelty and hatred humanity can sink to. The experiences of gay men in these camps were particularly brutal, adding another layer to the horror of the Holocaust. Yet, their stories also speak to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of such unimaginable adversity. Number 7. Forced Labor and Brutality the Nazi regime's pervasive campaign of terror against gay men extended far beyond societal ostracism, punitive laws, and public humiliation. Forced labor and physical brutality were intrinsic elements of this terror, weaponized to inflict maximum physical and psychological pain. Forced labor was not an arbitrary component of the Nazi persecution machine, but a systematically orchestrated instrument of torture and extermination. Labeled as extermination through labor, this brutal strategy aimed at systematically depleting the strength and vitality of prisoners. Gay men, identified by their pink triangles, were often singled out for the harshest labor details. They were assigned to grueling tasks like quarry work, road construction, and clearing bomb debris. The physical labor was complemented by constant brutality. Gay men were routinely subjected to extreme violence at the hands of the SS guards and even fellow prisoners, they were often selected for violent punishments like flogging, which were meted out for the smallest infractions or sometimes arbitrarily. 
Additionally, gay men were often the victims of brutal sport killings, a sadistic practice where SS guards would hunt prisoners for sport or arrange fights between them for entertainment. As the lowest in the camp hierarchy, gay men were frequent targets of these horrific games, their suffering a source of amusement for their tormentors. This physical brutality was not only a means of inflicting pain, but also served as a tool of humiliation and degradation. It was a method to further strip away their dignity and humanity, reducing them to mere objects of ridicule and violence. The forced labor and physical brutality faced by gay men under the Nazi regime were chilling manifestations of a ruthless system designed to degrade, torment, and ultimately exterminate. The pain and suffering inflicted were immeasurable, leaving enduring physical and psychological scars on those who managed to survive. Despite these horrifying circumstances, many gay men demonstrated extraordinary resilience and courage, finding ways to resist, provide mutual support, and retain a semblance of their identity. Their stories, although marked by unimaginable hardship, also exemplify the indomitable strength of the human spirit in the face of profound adversity. Number 8. Medical Experiments in the dark annals of Nazi horrors, the medical experiments conducted on gay prisoners stand out as particularly atrocious. Under the guise of science and medicine, Nazi doctors subjected gay men to brutal procedures and tests in an attempt to understand and ultimately eradicate homosexuality. The architect of many of these horrifying experiments was Danish SS officer Dr. Karl Varnett. Working in Buchenwald and Neuengamme concentration camps, Werner believed he could cure homosexuality through hormonal changes. To this end, he developed a procedure that involved implanting artificial hormone glands into prisoners, aiming to stimulate the production of male hormones and suppress homosexual tendencies. The procedures were performed without consent and in deplorable conditions, often leading to severe infections and other complications. Despite the high failure rate, Vernet's work was actively supported by the SS leadership, reflecting their perverse obsession with both eliminating homosexuality and increasing the German birth rate. A parallel thread of experimentation sought to demonstrate that homosexuality was genetic. Dr. Josef Mengele, infamous for his cruel and deadly experiments at Auschwitz, was one of several who collected and studied the bodily tissues of murdered gay men, attempting to locate a gay gene. These studies, steeped in the perverted racial and genetic ideologies of the Nazis, further dehumanized gay prisoners, reducing them to mere subjects for gruesome research. Beyond these specific experiments, the broader medical establishment often treated gay prisoners with callous disregard. Many doctors viewed homosexuality as a mental illness, further legitimizing the harsh treatment and brutality gay men experienced. Regular medical care was usually withheld, and gay men were often selected for particularly dangerous tasks under the pretext that it might cure their supposed ailment. The medical experiments conducted on gay men during the Holocaust represent one of the most chilling abuses of science in history. Driven by a dangerous mix of pseudoscience, prejudice, and utter disregard for human life, these experiments subjected thousands of gay men to unimaginable suffering and degradation, the legacy of these horrifying abuses continues to reverberate, serving as a somber reminder of the depths humanity can sink to when science is corrupted by ideology. At the same time, the stories of those who endured and survived these ordeals bear testament to the strength of the human spirit in the face of such dark adversity. Number 9. The Disparity in Recognition and Reparations the aftermath of the Holocaust saw widespread international recognition of the genocide perpetrated by the Nazis and the establishment of reparations programs for the victims. However, gay victims of the Holocaust were often excluded from these processes, a reflection of the continued stigmatization and marginalization of the LGBTQ community. In the immediate aftermath of the war, the liberating allies did not recognize gay men as victims of the Holocaust. In fact, in many cases, gay men were re-imprisoned by the allies under the same paragraph 175 that the Nazis had used to persecute them. This lack of recognition extended to the broader societal narrative. The experiences of gay men during the Holocaust were largely silenced, 
with the pink triangle not included in the initial remembrance symbols of the Holocaust. Reparations for gay victims also lagged far behind those for other victim groups. When West Germany began providing compensation to Holocaust survivors in the 1950s, gay men were excluded. Homosexuality remained a crime in West Germany until 1969, and the convictions under paragraph 175 were not overturned until 1994. It took until 2002 for the German government to officially apologize to the gay community for the Nazi-era persecution. Despite these challenges, there have been significant strides towards recognition and reparation in recent years. Monuments dedicated to the gay victims of the Holocaust have been erected in cities like Berlin, Amsterdam and San Francisco. Advocacy groups have also been successful in pushing for more inclusive Holocaust education that recognizes the persecution of gay men. However, the struggle for recognition and reparation for gay Holocaust victims continues. Many survivors have passed away without seeing justice or receiving compensation. The marginalization and stigmatization of the LGBTQ plus community also persist, making the fight for recognition and justice an ongoing battle. The disparity in recognition and reparations for gay Holocaust victims underscores the deeply entrenched homophobia and discrimination that continue to pervade societies. It also speaks to the importance of acknowledging and rectifying these injustices, not only as a matter of justice for the victims, but also as a crucial step in confronting and dismantling these harmful prejudices. Number 10. The Legacy of the Pink Triangle once a symbol of persecution and humiliation under the Nazis, the Pink Triangle has been reclaimed and transformed into an emblem of pride and resistance in the modern LGBTQ movement. It serves as a potent reminder of the past atrocities committed against gay men and a symbol of the community's resilience and defiance. The Pink Triangle first started gaining contemporary significance in the 1970s, when gay liberation activists began using it as a symbol of remembrance for the gay victims of the Holocaust. By embracing a symbol of their oppression, the LGBTQ plus community sought to remember their past and recognize their ongoing struggles. In the 1980s and 90s, the Pink Triangle took on added meaning amidst the backdrop of the HIV AIDS epidemic. The AIDS advocacy group ACT UP adopted the inverted pink triangle as their logo with the accompanying slogan, Silence Equals Sign Death, drawing a parallel between the passive extermination of gay men during the Holocaust and the societal indifference towards the AIDS crisis. Today, the pink triangle continues to occupy a significant place in LGBTQ plus symbolism. It is often displayed during pride events and is also used in educational and awareness campaigns about the Holocaust and homophobia. It is also a prominent feature of memorials for gay Holocaust victims, serving as a somber reminder of the past atrocities. However, the legacy of the Pink Triangle is not without controversy. Some critics argue that its use risks oversimplifying the diverse experiences of gay men during the Holocaust and reducing them to a single collective tragedy. Others point to the risk of co-opting and commercializing the symbol, divorcing it from its historical context and diluting its potency. Despite these criticisms, the enduring relevance of the Pink Triangle lies in its ability to connect past and present, personal and political. It serves as a poignant reminder of the historical persecution faced by the LGBTQ plus community and a rallying cry for ongoing resistance against homophobia and discrimination. The pink triangle, once a badge of shame, has thus been transformed into a symbol of pride and resistance. Its legacy is a testament to the resilience and defiance of the LGBTQ plus community in the face of persecution and discrimination. Its continued relevance underscores the importance of remembering the past and acknowledging the ongoing struggles for LGBTQ plus rights and equality.